Okay, so we're uh, talking about Christology. We're talking about uh, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, we talked about, uh, we're, we're talking about his incarnation when he came in the flesh. Uh, we looked at the virgin birth. And now we're uh, at the nature of the incarnation, the kenosis or the self-emptying of Christ. So we'll just wait till everyone gets back. Uh, but you might want to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 as we'll be looking at that passage. So it's the nature of the incarnation. What, is, what actually happened when, when God the Son took on human flesh? And uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 is probably the best explanation of what is happening there. So uh, you could listen as I read these verses, starting in verse 5. Uh, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So this, right in this, this little passage here, and many believe this was, this was like a, uh, either like a doctrinal statement or a, a song, a hymn that the early church sang, uh, to remind them of, of the Incarnation, to remind them of, of what Jesus had done in coming to this earth. Uh, you'll notice it starts off where it shows that He eternally existed before He came to this earth. He was equal to God. So right away this passage talks about His deity, but the emphasis is... is how that deity could come to this earth and how he could take on flesh. And so it says that even though he was equal with God, he did not think of that relationship or that aspect to be something to necessarily uh, be so prominent that he couldn't do other things. And, and so he made himself nothing, as it said, says here, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And so far as to look just like a man, and, and again, this is humbling himself. So this is a real act on his part to, to humble himself. It wasn't, it wasn't just you know, something, oh, I'll just do this. It, it was a real act. I mean, think of God, God humbling himself. It, it's hard, is it hard for you to humble yourself? Yeah, well, sometimes it isn't, but other times, you know, when you're humiliated, it's a lot easier to be humble, right? It's interesting how those two words are kind of closely connected. And so sometimes if, if you're not humbling yourself, guess what? God's going to humiliate you in a sense so that you will be humbled. But humbling yourself is not an easy thing to do. And um, even as Christians, and we know that that's something we ought to do, it's, it's not always easy. And even when we do it, often in the back of mind we're thinking, yeah, I said those things, but I'm, I'm actually a pretty great person. You know, we, we kind of justify why we would humble ourselves, and we almost take pride in our humility sometimes. But think of God, the Almighty God, humbling himself. So that's, that's the picture we have here. So he humbled himself, and the way he humbled himself was taking on human likeness. And so don't take that as a cut as the fact that you're human, okay? It's not like he's saying, oh, man, I'll get become like one of those guys. No, he, he did this all out of love. He did this in order to bring salvation. So, but he humbled himself even to the point of death. So you can imagine, he could have said, okay, I'm going to come to the earth as a man, but, you know, I don't have to die. I could just show people, hey, I'm, I'm the son of God and believe in me and so on and so forth. But... Um, he went so far as to, to take, take upon himself even death. And, and that's, that's how far his humility went, in a sense. And uh, obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so if you know uh, 
Hebrew history, you know to, to die on a cross, to die on a tree is, is, is a terrible thing. You're, you're basically condemned. And um, crucifixion by the Romans was usually reserved just for the worst of criminals, the criminals who were uh, antagonistic towards the state. And so what, what a humility he went through because he was not a rebel against the state. And yet he took on a death of crucifixion. And of course, the end though, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him a name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth, under the earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we see in this passage that it talks about his eternal existence, before he even came to this earth, it talks about how he was equal to God. He emptied himself. He took on humanity. And of course, the big question is, what does it mean that he emptied himself? What did he empty himself of? Some would say, well, he, he, he put aside the, the, the characteristics of deity while he was upon this earth. Now, even as you say that, there's a wide range of that. Because you could say, oh, so are you saying that while he was on this earth, he wasn't God? And I, I, I think we could clearly say that wasn't the case. But we can say that he did not uh, allow those aspects of God that would prove to people you're God to come out. So that if, if you were walking down the street in Jerusalem and Jesus was walking the other way, you would never say, hey, there goes God. You, you know, it would just not be one of those things because he did not show that. Now, many would say, well, he did all those miracles. He, you know, had great knowledge, great teaching. But, you know, even, even Jesus said that he did things through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, so many believe that even his miracles were more the works that the Holy Spirit did through him rather than generated from him as deity. So that's why some people look at this passage and say this, this talks about the hidden nature of Jesus while he was here upon this earth. In a sense, he hid his deity. Um, but later on, we're going to talk specifically about both the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so this, this shows you how this happened, that Jesus who already was God, took on humanity. So now he has the two natures. Did you have a comment or question? Yeah, so you're saying like, since Jesus, like he had the ability to do all those miracles, but he needed the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, kind of like how we, we're all saying like Jesus is the example, like he did yeah, do all exactly. the Jesus did uh, through the Holy Spirit. But like, just the story of like the woman grabbing his, like the red of his garment, or, like the hem of it, and he's like, oh, so like, like power left for yeah. me. I, I still think you could, you could say that, that that was still related to the spiritual power he had through the Holy Spirit. Um, I mean, in, in certain charismatic and Pentecostal uh, groups, you have people giving out prayer cloths and things like that. So there's, there's always been that, that idea of having a, a connection to that which is miraculous, that which is spiritual. It doesn't necessarily mean it's deity, though. So, yeah, so you could kind of make that distinction. Um, it, it would be also how you could explain, for instance, when Jesus was prophesying about the end, you know, the destruction of the temple and his return, and he talked about his re the return and the setting up of the kingdom, and he said, no, one, no man knows that hour except the Son of God, I mean, except God. Even the Son of, God, or the Son of Man does not know that. And, and does Jesus know when he's returning? I think he does now. But I think he put that aside in a sense. So, uh, and obviously that could bring up a whole, a whole kinds of questions. And, and we're going to talk later on about how, 
how much did, did he put aside? Did he put aside enough so that he possibly could have sinned? Now, we know he didn't sin, but we're going to talk a little about could he have sinned? And, and that's another debate among theologians, too. So, okay. Exactly. So he looks like man. He has a man's body, but he's still God inside of that body. Yes, but, but I think he also put aside certain of his abilities as God. Put them aside. He, didn't, like, he chose not to use them. Yeah, exactly. That's, I, that's how I put it. But others, others will say, and my wife and I have this big argument with each other about this. She, she feels he literally kind of set it aside, like left it up in heaven. And I said, no, no, that, that would be impossible. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. Well, I said, do you believe he was God when he was on earth? She goes, well, yeah, I do. But that's only one translation. There's a lot of different translations of what that Well, yeah, but I, I, I guess the point I'm making is he made a choice not only to choose to be humble, but in choosing humility to put on flesh and to die, and those are all things that are not um, aspects of deity, okay? <laughs> so that's his humanity. Um, he also made the choice not to use his divine prerogatives, his divine abilities in a way that would have shown to the world that he was God, okay? And, and um, that, that's what I, I think happened. And, and it wasn't until, in a sense, his resurrection and then finally his ascension and then being placed at the right hand of the Father that, that the second part of this, this passage came about. God exalted him to the highest place, so at the name of Jesus. And, and so think about that, the name of Jesus, what that means, even though people... A lot of people don't necessarily believe in him or reject him. Jesus is, is known by everybody. And, and, and one day, um, everything in heaven and earth and under the earth will, will bow before him. So, but yeah, that, that's just one of those debatable things. It's, it's, it, that's really the question. What, what did he empty himself of? What did he set aside, if you want to put it that way? Let's see. Because he did set aside something. So. All right. Another way to put it is that his deity was veiled. It was covered. Okay? Any, any other thoughts or questions on Philippians 2? Okay. Next section is the, the uh, purpose of the incarnation. I have a number of... Um, elements here. First of all, the purpose of the incarnation was to reveal the Father to us. John 1.18 uh, speaks of that. Jesus came to reveal the Father. We see the Father through Him. That's how we know God, through Jesus. Uh, secondly, to provide an example for living, 1 Peter 2, 21. I think, I think these are all in your notes, so you don't, if you have the notes, you don't need to take down even the passages. I think they're already in there. Um, to provide a sacrifice for sin. When you think about it, only a God-man could achieve salvation. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Also Hebrews 2, 1 John 2, Colossians 1. A number of passages talk about how uh, because of who he is, because he is the God-man, he can provide uh, a sacrifice for sins. Uh, number 4, to destroy the works of the devil. This is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Number five, to become a merciful and faithful high priest from Hebrews chapter five. Hebrews is uh, probably one of the best passages to talk about Jesus as our priest. 
And in order to be a priest, he had to be a human. Now, he is a priest after Melchizedek, not after Aaron. We'll talk a little about that later when we talk about his, his roles. Um, but yeah, he, 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 one of the purposes of the incarnation was so he could be a faithful high priest. Uh, six, uh, to fulfill the promise of a son to sit on the throne of David forever. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 33, uh, quoting from the Old Testament. Uh, number seven, to be qualified as a judge. John chapter 5, 22 through 27. Because he is the God-man, he can judge the world. Number eight, to confirm God's promises. Roman chapter 15, 8 through 12. Number nine, to show us that God has not abandoned us, but he loves us. And also to show that human life has value. I mean, just creation should tell us that human life has value, but this shows our value even more, that God himself would come in, in our body, in our flesh, uh, to die for us. Okay, any questions on the purpose of the Incarnation? I mean, there may be other purposes, but those are just uh, some that I came up with. Go ahead. What was the passage for the first one? The, the year of the Lord God spoke? Um, John 1, 18. Yeah. Okay, next category we're going to look at is the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus never violated the law of God. He never sinned, never did anything against principles of God. We see that in Scripture, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, he was a child, he was called a holy child. John chapter 8, 46, John 15, the fact that he's offered up as a sacrifice, Old Testament law, so the sacrifice had to be without blemish, without spot. And so that shows Jesus' sinlessness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 talks about he who knew no sin, yet took on our sin. So there are a number of passages that talk about the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Uh, the big question, though, is could he have sinned? Shall we take a vote here? How many say no? That he couldn't have sinned. How many say yes, he could have? How many have say, I don't know? Please enlighten me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, and that's a debatable issue. And I, I, how is it a debatable yeah, issue? He's God, he's perfect. He didn't take, get rid of his perfect. <clears throat> okay, well, the, 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 one of the ways to do it. Now, I, I, my belief is that he could not have sinned. But... I'll, I'll try to defend the other view, even though that's not my position. So some of you who will raise your hand and, and feel that he could have sinned, maybe you've got some insight that, that maybe I don't have. But mainly from Hebrews, where it talks about he's our, our high priest, when it talks about how he understands and relates he, every temptation that we've had, he understands, he sympathizes with. <coughs> And so the idea is that how can you really sympathize with something that isn't real to you? If he could not have sinned, how, how valuable, in a sense, is his sympathy towards us, is, well, is the argument. Well, he not sin, and so he was tempted. Oh, oh. He had those feelings. Okay, but, but, but most of us here would probably say, because many of us come from Christian homes, and even the testimony we have today, even as Christians... Uh, how how easy it is to yield to temptation, okay? How easy it is to sin. So if he could not have sinned, some would say, then his temptations aren't that real, aren't that strong. If, he knows all things, so he knows how we feel. No, I know. No yeah, no, you're you're doing a great job arguing for that side. I'm I'm trying to to show where where the other side because you you obviously were incredulous that some would even believe that he could have sinned, okay? Uh, but, but the reality is, 
we all agree he did not sin. That, that's the thing we agree on, okay? So the question is, could he have sinned? Could he not have sinned? How, and this relates to how much did he set aside his divine prerogatives, in a sense? Did he expose himself to the place of, of being able to sin? Now, part of this question deals with if we believe that mankind is born with a sin nature, and we haven't studied anthropology yet where we're going to talk more about this, then we have to ask ourselves, did Jesus, was he born with a sin nature? And traditional Christianity says, no, he wasn't. That's partly why the virgin birth is so emphasized among Orthodox um, conservative Christians, because it was the virgin birth that protected him, in a sense, from receiving the sin nature. So many would say, well, if he didn't have a sin nature, then he right there tells us he was a little different than us, even though he took on humanity, if he did not take on a sin nature, that's, that's a big area of our lives that he didn't take on, okay? So, but just because he didn't take on a sin nature still does not uh, say that he could not have sinned because Adam and Eve did not have a sin nature. And he's perfect, totally and, and, and not. <laughs> okay, but see, but see, you're you're emphasizing the deity of Jesus you Christ. Have to press his, his holiness. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, so Help me out here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just to chime in on that, I think what's important to realize is obviously through Scripture and through us drawing closer to the Lord, we learn more of God's characteristics, and we learn kind of we develop that relationship when we learn more about. Just like if you have a close friend that you've had most of your life and you meet them. Like you, you understand them well, you can better understand what they're going to do. But what this gets into is this gets into the conversation on free will. Because for God to truly be human, he has to be, and I think you agree, he had to be tempted to sin. And then obviously through scripture, we know that God's not going to fall into sin. But the choice that he had is he, if he wanted to choose that, he could have. We just know that he wouldn't want to because he's God. But that temptation shows the choice of free will. And that's a very important choice when you get into commandment. Here's how my wife says it. She goes, when I always say, well, well could, could Jesus have sinned? Um, and, 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 and she, and like me, we, we don't believe he could have. But I'm, I'm not as strong as she is on that. And, and so I've, I'm always egging her on. And, and so I said, well, um, how real were his temptations then if he couldn't have sinned? And she goes, basically what, what you just said, Cooper, that he had the choice to do that. But my wife would say, but if he had done that, the whole universe would have just blown up because it would have been God sinning. And that's kind of what you're saying. You're saying that's an impossibility. But, but let's, let's not take away from that free will. Or, or even in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So when, when I read that, even though I, I move more towards a side where he couldn't have sinned, I read a verse like that, it tells me that temptation was real to him. And I can never say when I'm tempted and I fall into sin and I confess my sin and I'm crying out to God and God says, here, just remember... You know, I, I, I understand and I feel for you and all that. And I go, part of me wants to say, no, you really don't because you couldn't have sinned is what I want to say to Jesus. But, but the reality is it was just as strong and powerful to him. Now, here, here's, here's a, an example or an illustration that you could use about this. An undefeatable army. In other words, an army that is so strong that it's the strongest army in the world can still be attacked, but it won't be defeated. So, so the temptation was real. And, and I think you, you're saying that because you have, said... No, I'm, uh, I might be swaying on that. So okay. I'm reading uh, James yes. 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now, if that's the case, when the devil tempted him in a human body, then... Yes, in a sense, he was tempted because the devil tempted him. He was trying to tempt him. But 
in that case, this is saying like he had no inclination to be to do those things at all because it was evil. It was the well, I think some of that speaks to the stupidity of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, well, I, I, I know, but I'm saying like I I think he can sympathize with us because he knows all things. He knows how we feel. He knows whatever. But I I'm I don't think he was actually tempted in his spirit to do wrong. Yeah, and him. I think this is a learning example for free will and for us understanding that. So just like you develop a friendship with me and you know that like I'm not gonna most likely I'm not gonna murder somebody in cold blood. <laughs> most <laughs> likely <laughs> and how do you defend in Christ to the degree you are shows that deep in the relationship you have with him. You understand that he's not gonna do that. He's not gonna fall into sin. And I think that's where the reason why this is important though is because Understanding that we have a choice, just like Jesus had a choice, makes us not robots. It means that God gives us that ability to choose, and that can't be discredited because if it is, that totally changes how we perceive God. Yeah, yeah that's 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 really good. I, I I really appreciate what you said about that and how even those who might believe that he could have sinned are also saying. Thank you, Lord, you never did. And what a great Lord you are, and you are God, and I trust in you. See, it's, it, it, either, either way, I think it, you, you, can, you can have a greater appreciation of who Jesus is, no matter which side you, you, you land on here. And, and, and maybe the difference is how much you may be stressing the humanity or the deity part, which is the struggle you have when you have one person with two natures that's we we can't un, totally understand that and and so when when i read a verse like this where it says that he suffered because when i think of suffering i think of suffering related to sin and punishment and all those kinds of things but that's we also know there's innocent kind of suffering which is what jesus did the whole the whole time in his life so so but, but, you know, it, to me, this verse is so comforting to me. It's not, it's not a verse about theology, about who Jesus is, as much as it's a verse that says to me, wow, you, you have a high priest. You have someone who totally understands. When I fall into sin, and sometimes it's the same old sin, you, and you come back to confess, and you feel like, okay, here I am, Lord, confessing again, and you think, you know, he just wants to turn me away, just wants to throw me out. And you go, no, Jesus is pleading on my behalf. He's interceding for me. That's, that's what's so amazing. Go ahead. So um, how do you describe sin? I've heard some describe it as missing the mark. Would you have a different definition? Uh, to me, the, the biblical words for sin, there's many of them. And, and just like most theological um, words and principles in scripture, it's very broad meaning. So one of them, it, one of the definitions, the most common Greek word for sin is missing the mark. Um, but there's also transgressing. In other words, you cross over a line that's been made. It's, um, uh, I think it's, I think it was, it's either Paul or Peter said that, that sin is lawlessness. So it's breaking the law of God. So, the, you know, the, you can only have sin if there's, there's already a principle of what is right and what is wrong. It, that rightness and wrongness doesn't just come from our minds. See, there there's must be something out there that, that tells us this is right, this is wrong. And so sin would be doing what's wrong or not doing what's right. And even James talks about the sin, what we often call the sin of omission. Knowing, knowing that you should do something, but you don't do it, that's considered sin too. So, so yeah, I, I tend to look at sin very broadly. And even the one for missing the mark, I was reading an article recently, and we tend to think that sin, okay, I missed the mark. You think of you're your shooting a, a bow and arrow, and that's the, that's the image of the Greek word, and you miss the target. Um, but this, this article I was reading starts off with this, this girl, um, she, she was just playing in her backyard, and all of a sudden, this arrow came and, and pierced her. And what it was is some guy next to her was, was target shooting with an arrow, and he missed the mark, but he hit her. 
See, I've always in my mind said, okay, missing the mark, that's all just personal, it's all me. But what we fail to realize is often when we sin, not only do we miss the mark, but maybe that arrow hits somebody else and affects somebody else. And that, that made me realize, because we, we tend to think like this sometimes. Well, you know, that's not too bad because it doesn't hurt anybody. See? You know, I, I could go out and do this. It's not going to hurt anybody. Maybe me. Maybe I'll feel a little guilty. But, you know, hey, I could just get forgiveness. But you don't know that for sure. Look at what they're finding about pornography and how it d doesn't just affect the viewer. It affects your relationships, and not just with the opposite sex, with everybody. It, it's amazing what they're finding out because pornography is so relevant now, they're able to do all these studies and find all these things. And so we need to realize there's a social aspect to sin. And so, yeah, missing the mark, but it's also transgressing the law. It's going against the will of God. So when you, when you start broadening the definition of sin, you, you realize it's, it's not just finding the exact laws and saying, okay, I could check those off. That's legalism. But, but what God wants us to do is have his heart and to have a heart that desires after that which is right and that which is good and that which is beautiful. And it, it's not just not doing what is bad. And, and that's how we start off kind of, you know, that's how we learn as children. Our parents say, don't do that. And so, you know, you, you kind of go through, okay, my mom said, no, don't do that, so I'm not going to do that. Well, at least I'm not going to get caught doing it. <laughs> you know, that's how we tend to do it. But that's how we think of sin. But sin is, is to me, much broader. And, and that's why, for instance, you have right now a conversation going on in our nation about how, how pervasive is racism. And does racism, is it just something that's an individual thing? And so you can say, well, you know, I don't, I don't hate people that are not of my race, so I'm not a racist. But if, but if you aren't even aware of what's going on in our society and how you might be a part of that or how you can help it and you're not doing anything about it, should those be the kinds of things we should be thinking about also? I think so. And I think the Bible talks a lot about societal sin or how your sin affects other people. And to me, the, the greatest story is the one of Achan. Remember when they went into the promised land, they, went, they destroyed Jericho, then they came to this tiny little town, Ai, and they got defeated. And what they found out, this one guy, when they plundered Jericho, he had kept some of the treasures to himself. And no one knew about it till then, <laughs> but affected the whole, whole group. Yeah, well, his whole family, extended family, even, <laughs> yeah. So um, when I think of sin, I, uh, my definition of sin gets broader and broader. And, and so then I start thinking more in terms of, okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at what are the specific sins that I'm breaking, but what is the heart of God? What is the righteousness of God that I need to be pursuing? And... and you know that. Uh, what what is the heart of God? Uh, I I I not 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 focus on the specifics of each and every sin. In other words, that's legalism. Legalism is is where you kind of say, okay, here's the here's my list, and I could check it off, and if I check off everything, and I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. That that's kind of a legalism. A legalism that says. You know, hey, I, I know the law, and I just fulfill it, and I'm good. But, you know, the Bible talks a lot about our motives, our intentions, all those kinds of things that go into it. Okay, question here, and then Cooper. Um, I was just curious about the, she says, um, not being able to sin. What was the point of him living an entire life if it was just, if he wasn't going to sin in the first place? Like, why didn't he just come down and <coughs> I, I think partly to show that he was the perfect sacrifice. Um, some forms of Protestant, Protestantism do, do not stress, uh, they, only, they only talk about uh, God's, or 
God's redeeming power in, through Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. But others say even his life um, works for our redemption because he led a sinless life. So that, as Paul says in Corinthians, when he took on our sin, we took on his righteousness. So if he doesn't have a righteousness that we could look at and say, wow, he kept the law, he did everything right, then, then it's not as powerful when we say, oh, we have Christ's righteousness. We tend to think of that only in terms of our specific salvation rather than our everyday life where his righteousness can help us live that kind of righteous life. So yeah, I, I think he had to go through all that. I think partly, uh, you know, when, when it talks about he, the sins were laid upon him on the cross, I, I think he had to see that and experience it in a sense. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, in a sense, what to me makes it even more powerful when it says he took on our sin. It's not just this theological, philosophical idea that he took on our sin. He saw it. He experienced it. How many times, you know, he says he weeps over Jerusalem. He sees the sinfulness of mankind, and it, it breaks his heart. And that's, that's what sin ought to do with us. For, for many of us, sin is, I just want to avoid it, and Lord, help me to avoid it. Oh, I, I messed up again. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. But it, it also should be, you know, when I see the sin of this world, when I see the sin around me, it, it should break our hearts. And, and obviously we pray first, but then we say, Lord, what can I do? What should I do? So, so anyway, that's, that's the issue. Did, could he have sinned? Could he have not have sinned? Either way, his temptation was real and was strong and powerful. And as it says in Hebrews, he suffered during that time. So, all right, we'll break there. We didn't get very far, but... Uh, I enjoy these questions, and I, I knew we wouldn't get very far with, with the, the, the uh, theological term is the peccability and the impeccability of, of Jesus Christ. So now you got another theological word you can use. So, All right. Thank you.